Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Pamela Jefferson Mamer with the U.S. Department of Education's International and Foreign Language Education Programs in the International Studies Division, and I'll be your moderator today for our wonderful session on innovations in, um, and collaborations for minority-serving institutions. Um, and our Title VI programs. So I know this session will be very interesting and there will be a lot of information shared today that you can take back to your institutions and really begin um, thinking about what kind of collaborations you can have with our minority serving institutions. So today we have a wonderful slate of um, individuals and distinguished guests on our panel and let me introduce our esteemed panel, we have Dr. Jill Meredith Lane from New York University who will be discussing their collaboration between Columbia University, Lehman College, and New York University. We also have Dr. William Nichols, Director of Culture at Georgia State University who will talk about his Title VI programs. Dr. Avery Dick Dickens de Heron from Vanderbilt University and her team will discuss their Latin American National Resource Center partnerships with Florida International University, Tulane University, and the University of New Mexico. So each speaker will present for 10 minutes and we will leave the last 15 minutes or so at the end for questions. So we'll start with Dr. Jill Lane. Jill? Hi, good afternoon. My name, as you know, is Jill Lane. I'm with the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies uh, here at NYU. I'm speaking on behalf of colleagues from Columbia University and Lehman College. And I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to share our project, the Indigenous and Diasporic Language Consortium or the IDLC. And I do have some slides to share with you if we wanna put those up. Um, I'll get to the one on the screen in just a moment. The IDLC is a partnership of the Institute for Latin American Studies at Columbia, the Jaime Lucero Mexican Studies Institute at Lehman, and the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies here at NYU. Its primary function is to promote and to promote the teaching, learning, and study of indigenous and diasporic languages of the Americas. The consortium allows currently enrolled students from each institution to study languages at the other, and it provides research and resources to support and promote the teaching and learning of these languages. So the languages are Haitian Creole at NYU, Mixtec, Lehman, uh, Nahuatl at Columbia, and Quechua, again at NYU. As the slide before you indicates, fundamental to our approach is the recognition that the languages of the IDLC are vibrant local languages tied to longstanding and new communities in the city. And they are not just foreign languages beyond, um, beyond, the United, uh, beyond our shores. Connection to those communities has become a central part of how we think about our language programs, our curricular development, um, and the context um, that we try to provide students as we teach them. So next slide. NYU has offered Quechua since 2008, and in a way is the cornerstone of the program, of the, the consortium, since we have this long history. It offers both elementary and intermediate levels, um, two, two elementary levels, two intermediate levels every year, and also offers some advanced independent studies. NYU's Quechua program has developed a range of new language resources, including a first ever Quechua podcast series, Rimasun, which we use in our classes, and we hope that, um, and we are told, um, are used in Quechua classes around the country. Lehman College, on the next slide, has been offering um, uh, Mishtek since 2017. It's in its second um, offering. Um, it has uh, been a process of the entire uh, grant cycle to bring Mishtek to Lehman, and it is now functioning really quite successfully. To build the curriculum, Lehman has collaborated with INALI, the Instituto Nacional de Lenguas Indígenas, the National Institute of Indigenous Languages in Mexico. 
The interesting thing about working with Lehman is that by um, hosting the course at Lehman as part of their regular um, curriculum, the Mishtek course is open to all undergraduate and graduate students in the CUNY system. So its reach is enormous. The other thing I would note about working with, uh, with Lehman um, is that the students who have registered thus far um, for the Mishtek course are in the majority heritage speakers. You can go to the next slide. Columbia has been offering Nahuatl since uh, the spring of 2016. They're now offering regularly comprehensive elementary Nahuatl and intermediate Nahuatl. Columbia's approach um, is uh, an interesting one, addressing two different constituencies for the language. One, classical Nahuatl for graduates, usually graduate students who, um, who want this as part of their, their PhD study. Um, but it's, uh, it primarily approaches Nahuatl as a vital living language, um, and it has approached Nahuatl in ways that are alert to and sensitive to the dialectical and cultural diversity of the Nahuatl language as spoken in Mexico. And finally, next slide. Um, at NYU, we've been offering Haitian Creole since the fall of 2015. Um, all of these languages, again, were part of our most recent uh, grant cycle. And um, we were very, very proud to bring Haitian Creole to NYU as part of this part of this project. We regularly now teach two levels of Creole, one and two, and we're in the process of creating an intermediate level. To build the curriculum, Clax partnered with the Haitian Creole Language Institute of New York City. Um, and as part of its classes, um, I think this is an interesting, a very interesting element of the course. Um, students work on the platform WikiEDU and they have created content for the Haitian Creole Wikipedia um, as part of the, some of the course assignments. Hosting. Um, and they have created content about Haiti and its language on, on Wikipedia. Um, the work is documented on Twitter and other social media at Creole at NYU. As you'll see in just one moment, the instructor, Winnie Lamour of this class, has been um, very innovative in thinking about uses of social media in um, the teaching of less commonly taught languages. If I could have the next slide. So one of the things we've been working on at all three campuses is the integration of all four languages into existing degree programs. At NYU, all four languages satisfy the College of Arts and Sciences language requirement, and all four satisfy the language requisites for the major and the minor in Latin American studies. And I would note, um, we're very pleased by this, that for the major and minor, the students can choose one of these languages as their primary language, if they like, um, uh, instead of or in addition to Spanish. This is a, a somewhat radical move, and we were very pleased when the faculty embraced it. Um, the uh, Quechua, Nahuatl, and Mixtec satisfy a language requirement for a new minor in Native American and Indigenous Studies. And I just got an email from our colleagues at Lehman to say that um, Mixtec can now officially be taken uh, as part of their minor in Mexican and Mexican-American Studies. So we see this as um, essential to not just the institutional commitment to these languages, but um, to the sustainability of, um, of kind of continued um, student populations that will be interested in, in the classes, but a real understanding of their importance to the degree programs and fields that, um, that, are, that are related to the languages. I could get the next slide. We've been working on developing new teaching materials that will all be housed by the end of the grant cycle on our dedicated website. Um, and I don't know that I wrote that down. It's idlc.nyc. As I said, some courses generate materials available for use by others, like the uh, Haitian Creole uh, Wikipedia. Um, and others, uh, in other cases, we have outreach events um, that generate material use for, for teaching. Um, we had, for example, a very interesting uh, Creole poetry slam um, that has then been brought back into the classroom um, to teach some of that work. At Columbia, they hosted uh, the Mayan hip hop trio Balam Akpu. Um, and that too found its way back into, into the classroom. If I could move forward, um, I'm gonna skip this slide. It'll be here for us if we wanna talk about sort of how we have been financing this. Could I move on to one slide further? Thank you. 
So one of the things that has been important to us in thinking about the IDLC is um, and what happens when you start interacting with um, local communities for whom this is a either a native language or in many cases a heritage language in the context of New York City is um, we come up alive to the ways in which um, these languages are also um, historically undervalued languages. Um, and what do we mean by that? Well, um, I guess it, it, it may be self-evident, but um, it's worth underscoring. It's a language that suffers from systemic social cultural, and cultural degradation, exists in the shadow of a more dominant uh, language, and is spoken by historically disadvantaged and marginalized uh, peoples. Um, and you see here an image, it's hard for you to make it out, I imagine, but it's an image of our instructor, um, Winnie Lamour presenting a piece called Rehumanizing Haiti at the Wiki Conference of North America 2016 in San Diego. And what she has been involved in, and I think it's quite interesting, is to take up the challenge of what it means to think of a lictal as a historically Ooh. undervalued language. And um, in her case, she's interested in shifting the image and perception of the language as a means to find sustainable ways to positively promote and preserve the language. So this focus on shifting the image um, links up the work we're doing with language to the larger work we would be doing in our outreach and in our academic work in, um, in, in, in area studies as a whole. And I think um, if I could move forward, um, I'll just do this quickly. I'll give you a couple of examples uh, by way of conclusion. If um, we could move to um, two more slides. So, and one more. Thank you. Um, Mishtek, uh, our colleagues at Lehman, um, have approached the notion of outreach and connection with um, heritage speakers by, um, by being able, and I think this was quite an accomplishment, to open a parallel non-credit track to their courses that would allow students both in the city and um, online um, to participate in the course. So following a path very much like what our colleagues were describing earlier um, in the afternoon. They were able to offer scholarships to these non-credit students, and they did so on condition that the student at the end of the course helped develop some teaching materials that might be used for um, children of Mixteco descent. Um, and this has been a really interesting way for them to uh, reach out to um, those who are interested in the language but are particularly interested in it as a, um, as a, a heritage language and one that connects them to their own community. And if I could have one more slide, and I might conclude here. Um, our Creole outreach um, is, uh, uh, as I said, one that has paid a lot of attention to the role of um, social, uh, social media and has um, really tried to use social media to bring a larger community of people um, to the projects that we're involved in and the larger uh, conversations we're interested in participating. Um, in. Um, so we see the outreach that we do for all of these languages um, and collaborations in outreach as well as language as a central part of um, how to think about the relevance of these languages, how to shift the image of um, how they are um, lived and perceived even by heritage speakers themselves of the languages. Um, and I think what I will do is, um, I had a couple more examples I can share with you, but maybe in the Q&A, and maybe for now, I'll leave it at that. And um, thank you for letting me share uh, this project that we're so excited in with the rest of you. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lane. Um, the, you all are doing some really interesting and creative activities with your students and with the languages. So now let's go to uh, Dr. Nichols, Dr. William Nichols at Georgia State University. He's the director of the culture program there. Bill? 
Hello, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm the director of culture, which is the Center for Urban Language Teaching and Research. Uh, we are a relatively new language resource center, uh, and we're a small but very effective team. I'm joined uh, at culture by my associate director, Trish Noli, our uh, project coordinator, Christy Winkler, and our tech coordinator, David Cotter. Um, and we are a Title VI uh, National Foreign Language Resource Center. If you go to the next slide, please. And these are centers that traditionally support uh, language learning and language instruction through the development of teacher workshops uh, for teachers, language teachers in the K through 16 continuum. Uh, we develop materials uh, and we work on collaborations with, with school districts to support language learning and language instruction. Uh, that we develop free tech resources as well as development of tools for assessment of language proficiency. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, two things that I would like to highlight uh, among the activities that, that we do and, and ways that we distinguish ourselves among the LRC community is through our focus on outreach and, and advocacy. Uh, from the beginning, we wanted to really take advantage of our location in the heart of Atlanta to, to identify stakeholders that could aid us in advocating and promoting for language programs in the K through 16 continuum, primarily by really focusing on the career opportunities that open with uh, language learning and, and cultural competence. So the first uh, event that I wanna highlight, and these two events kind of serve as bookends to each other. Um, the first one we do, we organize in the spring and we call it the Global Languages Leadership Meeting. And in the, at this event, we, we organize it as a luncheon, so we really try to entice people to attend by offering them food. Um, but we, we bring together business leaders, nonprofit organizations, uh, uh, government agencies, as well as policymakers, uh, along with education leaders, to talk about the importance of language learning and cultural skills and, and global skills for career opportunities. And, the purpose has always been to try and forge a symbiotic relationship among these various groups. We all have an interest and a passion for, for languages, but we really try to find ways to forge collaborations and work together to advance the, the um, level and visibility of, of language learning among, among our students, especially underrepresented students uh, in K through 16. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, for those interested, we are currently kind of working on our next iteration of, of this event, uh, which will be held in, in May of 2018. And as you can see, uh, we, we do or organize and invite us for a speaker to attend and address the, the importance of language learning in kind of a, cor a corporate or, or business or career setting. And in, in May, we'll be inviting Seema Jane, who is the Director of Multicultural Affairs for Marriott International, and we'll be able to kind of address the, the value of language learning, if we use those terms, beyond an academic setting. Um, uh, could you go to the next slide, please? At the other end of the spectrum uh, in, in the fall, and we're currently, as you can see, in the midst of finalizing details for next week's events uh, that we call World Languages Day, and this is uh, something that we kind of refer to as a Global Languages Resource Fair, and essentially, we, we bring employers from various fields, public health, uh, business, hospitality, uh, et cetera, to meet with high school students and college students to, to inform them of the importance of studying languages and acquiring these, this cultural competence for career opportunities in the future. Uh, from, from my own point of view, I felt like, you know, as a language professor, as a department chair, as a director of a Title VI Language Resource Center, you know, I can talk to students, but the, the odds of them really listening to me and believing that I'm saying something that is um, uh, sincere and not in my own self-interest and kind of preserving my job as a university professor, we, we wanted to bring these, these leaders in business, nonprofit, and government to meet with students so they, the students could hear directly from them about the importance they place on, on language and culture. So they, they understand that beyond the classroom and beyond their time at Georgia State or whatever uni university they are involved with, that they see the value that this will have later on in their life. Uh, 
this is our third iteration of this event. And over the, the past couple of years, we've really um, tried to hone in on what the steps are. Could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, and, and think about how we can bring this event to other uh, cities. So we've developed a teacher toolkit as well as an exhibitor toolkit um, to, to kind of map out uh, for other people in other cities. If you would like to do either the Global Languages Leadership Meeting or World Languages Day, we would like to help you do that. And we've kind of you know, gone through the fire so we know what, what the obstacles are, what some of the pitfalls are, the mistakes we've made, and, and suggestions we would make to anybody who would like to do this uh, in your hometown. Um, and here you can see some of the images uh, from, from previous events. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Uh, here's a list, and this I think will be available to, to anybody kind of uh, after the presentation. If you want to see or if you want to contact me directly, um, I can tell you about some of the exhibitors that we've had. Here's a, a list of previous events, and this will expand uh, with more exhibitors that will be attending next, next week. Um, and can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, and we've also been fortunate enough to uh, begin taking sponsorship, which also helps in offsetting some of the costs that are involved with, with organizing the event. Um, now, one of the um, goals last year when we uh, organized this event was to create a kind of promotional video that would help us in uh, getting the word out about the event that teachers could use as a tool to prepare students uh, for their visit and to help us um, really get kind of the word out about the, the collaborations that we're forging. So I'd like to lead into the video now and, and you can see kind of what we've, what we've presented and what we've pull, pulled together. There's 320 million people in the United States, right? That's a lot of people. But 90% of Americans don't speak a second language. If you guys pick one up, that puts you in that 10%. That gives you a leg up. So if anybody would like to contact us, here's our contact information, our phone number, email address, our website. There's more information at our website about both of these events. Uh, and with Global Languages Leadership Meeting, you can see um, previous presentations from uh, the past iterations. And for World Languages Day, you can see Mohammed's full uh, presentation at our, at our website. Thank you very much. Great, Bill. Thank you so much. That was a really wonderful presentation. And just as a note, uh, Georgia State University is one of our MSI institutions, and so we're wonderful to see the great work you're doing there. Uh, one housekeeping note is that if you would like to ask questions, uh, at the bottom of your screen is our chat feature, and you can write in your question. And at the end, we'll take your questions um, for our panelists and have a really lively discussion. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and start chatting, th typing those in. Okay, next we're going to go to Dr. Avery Dick Dickens de Heron at, from Vanderbilt University, and she's gonna discuss her collaboration. Avery? Thank you. 
so this is a collective presentation that's actually based on the work of four Latin American NRCs, which you can see listed here in partnership with our uh, with several minority serving institutions that include HBCUs, Hispanic serving institutions and community colleges. And the idea of the presentation is for us to share a variety of the forms that these partnerships can take place, as well as some of the um, cha common challenges that we face and some of the uh, keys that we think are important to developing these partnerships between MSIs and NRCs. Next slide, please. All right, so our first example comes from the University of New Mexico's Latin American and Iberian Institute, which has a partnership with Central New Mexico Community College. And for the past few years, they have been working on developing an associate degree in Latin American studies. And the idea behind this degree program is that when the students complete the two-year degree program at CNM, they are able to seamlessly transfer to University of New Mexico and then finish the four-year degree program. As part of this um, step, they've also developed new LAS courses at the um, at Central New Mexico Community College. And they've done this uh, in conjunction with doctoral students at the University of New Mexico. So we have doctoral students at UNM that are uh, co-teaching these courses. And so they're bringing their uh, expertise in Latin American studies to the CNM faculty. And the CNM faculty are essentially providing them with pro professional development training in terms of putting together a course and of course offering them teaching experience. Uh, they also have the opportunity, the doctoral students also have the opportunity to, to guest lecture in other courses beyond these Latin American content courses. And then finally, to provide some educational programming outside of the classroom, the partners have established a Latin American speaker series that takes place on Central New Mexico's campus um, and features faculty from the University of New Mexico as well as other NRC faculty. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, uh, they have had a pretty impressive record of outcomes in terms of increasing significant increases in the number of LAS majors at CNM from year to year. Next slide, please. So the other part of their partnership has been to develop a study abroad program. And the idea behind this program is that it's open to all students at Central New Mexico Community College. So it's not just limited to those students that are enrolled in the LAS degree program, but it's open to other students. And the idea is to essentially immerse them in the history, the culture, the politics of the target country, uh, which in this first case will be Guatemala in May 2018. They have been very intentional in creating a study abroad program that provides access to students that uh, have potentially have families or have full-time jobs, which is the case for a number of the students at Central New Mexico Community College. And so they're really trying to lower the barriers for these students to have a study abroad experience. And then finally, um, in addition to the study abroad program and the, the creation of a new degree program, they're building capacity, L LAII, the Latin American and Iberian Institute, is building capacity at Central New Mexico Community College by working with their newly established global education office to help um, build broader efforts in internationalization. And so they're actually going beyond just the focus on Latin America uh, to a broader experience in building capacity. Next slide, please. All right, so our next example comes uh, from Tulane Stone Center for Latin American Studies, which has a partnership with Xavier University. Xavier University is a Catholic HBCU, and of course, both of these institutions are located in New Orleans, and they have a history of collaboration and a history of professional ties, particularly among Latin American as faculty. And part of this um, has arisen because a number of the faculty, a number of the faculty at Xavier did their doctoral work at Tulane. And so this has provided a very 
natural basis for collaboration between the two institutions. And so in the first step of building this, of establishing this new partnership, uh, they made a very, what I would call strategic move in uh, setting up a series of focus groups with faculty, students, and administrators at both institutions to essentially map out what kind of partnership they would like to have and what sort of content they would like to focus on. And they've ended up with a fairly robust programming. They have a number of different cultural arts programs that has a community impact as well as an impact to the students on campus. They have developed a summer travel abroad program to Haiti and to Cuba. And they've also developed a new Afro-Latin America course that's taught by Xavier faculty. Next, please. Now, in terms of the challenges that these two institutions have faced, I think their challenges that they have confronted are actually very sim similar and very generalizable across these relationships between NSC, N NRC institutions and MSI institutions. And the first would be that the Xavier faculty have a very heavy teaching load and have very little time to devote outside of their teaching responsibilities to new projects and new programs. Similar, they have limited financial resources to devote to international projects. Um, and this is, of course, beyond the NRC, uh, the NRC funding. In addition to that, they've had a number of bureaucratic hurdles that range from something as simple as invoicing to much more complicated grant management. They've also uh, had a few uh, challenges in terms of moving students uh, seamlessly between the two campuses and confronting some differences in student cultures. However, uh, they've had a number of successes. They've been able to increase the interaction between faculty and students at both campuses. Importantly, they have increased awareness of the Afro-Latin American and the Black Hispanic American experience uh, for Xavier students, th particularly through the course. And like we saw with the New Mexico partnership, they've also cr contributed to a broader realization and attention on the part of Xavier's administration to the importance of internationalizing their education program. Next, please. Okay, my next example comes from my home institution, Vanderbilt. We have worked with Tuskegee University, which as you probably know, is another top HBCU along with Xavier. Uh, but th our partnership is different in a couple of ways from the two that I have described so far. The first way in which it's different is that we're located quite a distance from each other. Uh, Tuskegee is located in Macon County, Alabama, which is about five hours from Nashville which of course presents its own uh, set of complicated logistics. And the other way in which this partnership differs from the other two that you've that I've talked about so far is that we have focused our attention on outreach activities, outreach programming, rather than on students at the at the two um, partner universities. And so the core of our program has been professional development workshops that have been paired with documentary films. And what we've generally done is screened a film. This all happens on Tuskegee's campus. And we do a public film screening on Friday night that's open to the community as well as Tuskegee faculty and students. And then the following day, we do a professional development workshop for Macon County educators. And often these are teacher workshops that we've done at Vanderbilt. And then we essentially take the show on the road and replicate it at Tuskegee a couple of days later. All of the outreach programming that we've done with Tuskegee focuses on Afro-Latin America. And this has made sense to us because our faculty, our LAS faculty, faculty here at Vanderbilt have a great strength in the Black Atlantic world. And many of the topics that they work on are of um, great interest and relevance to Tuskegee students and faculty, as well as to the general public um, in, in Macon County in Alabama. The programming, of course, is developed in, in collaboration, and each workshop has featured Vanderbilt faculty alongside Tuskegee faculty. And this has been, for us, one of the most positive outcomes 
of this work together because as the faculty from the two different institutions have had to develop the workshops together, they have engaged in um, some real bi-directional learning uh, because they have brought their different perspectives on the topic at hand to the table. And so then they are able to share these diverse perspectives with the teachers that are attending the workshops. Next slide, please. All right, and so here you see a list um, of the various professional development workshops that we've offered. Uh, we average about one per year, and um, we would probably do more if we could, but this uh, shows you the limitation of the distance between the two institutions. So they've been on topics such as uh, favelas in Brazil, the Cuban literacy campaign, Zora Neale Hurston's work, the one outlier uh, was the bioethics panel. So this was not a professional development workshop, but what rather was a panel discussion that discussed the similarities of the syphilis studies that were carried out in the US South and in, in Guatemala. And this panel actually took place on Vanderbilt's campus and featured the director of Tuskegee's uh, Center for Bioethics. Next slide, please. Okay, and so my last example comes from Florida International University's uh, partnership through the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Institute with Northwest Arkansas Community College. And as you can see from the demographic, if for the demographic information up there, uh, the institutions are quite different. FIU is a Hispanic uh, serving institution that's located in an urban, you know, very urban campus and uh, is, is a much larger institution. Northwest Arkansas is a smaller college. It's a predominantly white student body and it's located in rural Arkansas. They are of course also located at quite a distance from each other, but they have a great shared interest in Haiti. And this is what brought these two institutions into a partnership. So the primary partner at Northwest Arkansas Community College is Yannick St. John. She's a sociologist who's from Haiti and she had a great interest in, in sharing her home country and her home, her home country's culture and history with her students at Northwest Arkansas Community College. FIU, um, as you may know, has, has had a longstanding program in Haitian studies and in Creole language and has a related study abroad program. And so they developed a partnership around developing a Haiti study abroad program that involved students from Northwest Arkansas. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so the first step in their partnership was essentially sending Yannick down to FIU's Haitian Summer Study Abroad Institute to, for her to get more comfortable with the Haitian Studies program and for them to essentially develop more of a re relationship. Uh, she, there was, she received funding from her provost office as well as from FIU, so I think it's important to note that there was institutional support for the program from the get-go. Uh, at the same time, FIU was working with faculty at Northwest Arkansas to um, help connect them, help, help them establish networks in Miami and in Haiti. And they also did an on the ground um, feasibility assessment for the Haitian studies, uh, for the study abroad program in Haiti. Besides that, they had ongoing conversations regarding program design and budget and risk management and so on. This, of course, as I've mentioned before, did require um, a good deal of investment of time and uh, financial resources. So the biggest challenges that they faced in this partnership were the different institutional requirements for the study abroad program. Uh, but they really, you know, I, I think there was a lot of passion. There is a lot of passion in this partnership, and it was really focused on the belief that the belief in the importance of a study abroad program, and particularly a study abroad program to a non traditional site like Haiti. Next slide, please. Okay, and so um, to wrap up, I just wanted to pull out a few of the key points that I think are reflected in these very different partnership, but I, partnerships, but I do think there are some commonalities. And the first one would be uh, the foundational, the foundation of the partnership really must be on content 
that, if, that it is of interest to both institutions and that builds on expertise at at least one and ideally both of the institutions. And so it's something that has to be built really from the ground up and ideally that builds capacity at the minority serving institution. And so what this really means is that not every institution is, is the best partner and it may not be the institution that is located in the town where your institution is located. It may be located in another state or um, a, across the country. The content is the key. Uh, in terms of goals, I think that all of us as NRCs recognize the importance of sharing our financial resources as well as the resources that we have in our staff. We generally tend to have bigger staffs that have more time to get, dedicate to such programming. Uh, but I think it, it's much more important. It goes beyond that. It's not just about funneling funds to another institution. It's really about working together, sharing different perspectives, and then sharing those diverse perspectives with our constituents, with our students, with our educators, and with faculty at the two different at the different partner institutions. Uh, in terms of process, as, as you've seen and as you know, um, it really does have to be a truly collaborative project. Collaborations always take more time, uh, but I think uh, I think the, the the time is certainly worth it. And I, all of us, and I know I speak for my colleagues, cannot underline the importance of the relationship between at least one person at each institution. You have to have a point person at each institution that's committed to the vision of the project, that is willing to dedicate the time uh, and that, that you can really trust. And this is why these partnerships take a long time to develop because they are based on relationships. Next slide, please. Uh, and so thank you. You can see here, uh, here is the contact information and the names of all my colleagues uh, whom the work of the, this presentation is based on. All of us will be available to answer questions during the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Avery. Sounds like you all are doing some really interesting and important work. And so now we're going to go into our question and answer session. Uh, we only have a few questions right now, so if you have questions, now's the time. Um, and let me start with our first question, um, and it is to Jill at NYU and the partners. The question is, do you make FLAS awards in the indigenous languages you offer? It looks like most of them don't have instruction available beyond the second year, so they're wondering if awarding FLAS for these languages is something you do or something you aspire to do. Hi, thank you for the question. Um, I, am, uh, I can say that it is something we, we aspire to in relation to those languages where we're just bringing the language classes online. Um, and are now offered at the elementary level and we're moving into the um, intermediate level. We have um, offered uh, FLAS for Quechua for some time now, and that is um, the, the, the majority of our FLAS, if not all of it in some years, goes to Quechua. But um, the reason that we're developing, um, uh, the reason we are developing um, Creole quickly now um, at the intermediate level is precisely so that we can award um, FLAS um, in uh, hopefully in the next cycle. Um, and we hope to continue to do the same. Um, I uh, agree with uh, our, our colleague from Vanderbilt that um, these kinds of projects take time and developing these uh, courses from zero to um, to the to the to the you know fully intermediate or advanced level um, takes some number of years, but that's what we're working towards. Thank you. Great. And another question for you, Jill, is that the uh, person wanted to know what is NYU's connection to MSI programs. Sure, I can answer that question. Um, I mean, I, I guess NYU as a whole may have many relationships to, to MSI programs, but in this project, um, Lehman College is the uh, um, MSI. It's a Hispanic serving institution, and that's the, the connection. Um, I should have said, but didn't, that NYU and Columbia are also part of a Title VI consortium. Um, so we, as a consortium, uh, a Title VI consortium, 
um, entered into a new relationship with uh, Lehman for this grant cycle and for this project. Great. Our next question is a really interesting one, um, and, and all of you may answer, is that K through 12 um, institutions, are those included in MSI outreach? Well, for, speaking for, for us, I mean, LRCs tend to focus on not just K through 12, but K through 16. And um, so that's one of our primary objectives is to reach out to high schools and draw that connection with, with higher education or universities in a more concrete and overt way. So that's, that's kind of core to our mission is, is outreach to high schools and, and school districts at all levels. This is Amanda from the University of New Mexico, and I wanted to share that we have an entirely separate project with Central New Mexico Community College. Um, this is Avery again, and I, I would also add to that, I would add to that that um, our work does work, go with um, our, our outreach programming, we don't necessarily go into the high schools, but we do work with educators. And so uh, we follow the model of working with educators. We're gonna have a greater impact on the students if we are sharing our resources with educators. Could um, answer that question just by noting a really interesting um, conference that um, our colleagues at Columbia hosted um, last year. And that conference was called Contributions of Indigenous Knowledge to Education Responding to New Migration in New York City Schools. And um, they understood this as part of their general outreach and work in relation to Nahuatl on the one hand and to the IDLC, um, but also their, their K-12 work um, as well. And it was a, a really major conference that brought together um, indigenous, uh, um, self-named indigenous leaders and, and uh, knowledge keepers um, to talk about migration, transnational ties between indigenous communities in the US and um, Mexico and how all of this plays itself out in the classroom. And it was attended by over 400 people and was um, uh, partly hosted with uh, Columbia's Teachers College. So that's one example. We don't do that every day, but um, an excellent example of how we tie the IDLC work to um, K-12 outreach. And this is uh, Lisa Picard at FIU. And um, currently we um, work with our Haitian student organization here at FIU in Miami and um, use their language skills and their expertise when we're doing K-12 outreach, particularly in the areas of STEM. We do a few programs with the uh, Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden, during which um, our Creole speakers here from FIU um, join me and another team of faculty administrators to, to basically explore ethnobotany and the importance of plants in Haiti, all conducted in Haitian Creole um, with uh, eighth grade students from Miami-Dade County Public Schools and then senior citizens from um, retirement villages or retirement communities um, that cater to Haitian Creole speaking clientele. Okay, our next question is for uh, Avery, in describing the New Mexico CNM Study Abroad Program, it shows student scholarships as one of the things provided to students. There have been a couple of other appearances of scholarships in connection with activities discussed in previous panels today. Can the U.S. Department of Education offer more detail on whether, oops, on whether this was paid from an NRC grant, and if so, was that made permissible? I will let my colleague Amanda Wolf answer that question. Do we have Amanda? Okay, uh, 
let me move on and if she comes back on the line, we will um, have her answer that question. Another question we have is, um, the, this is Lenny from the University of Florida. My question is for Avery. In developing your co collaboration with minority serving institutions, did you have support from university administration outside your center? And if so, in what ways? If not, how did you navigate this? Hi, thank you for the question, Lenny. Uh, we did not necessarily have support from the university administration. We did not uh, have any pushback from them, but we essentially did this as the Center for Latin American Studies built up this partnership with Tuskegee. And so uh, it is, as I, as I referred to in the presentation, it's something that has, we've built up over a number of years and it's taken time, you know, it's essentially two visits per year at Tuskegee. We bring our Tuskegee faculty up to Vanderbilt. Uh, and, and so it's been an ongoing relationship building process. At the same time, now I think the administration here at Vanderbilt looks upon this relationship very favorably because we have been doing it for a long time and because it's, uh, it's, it's very substantive. It's based on real expertise that we have at Vanderbilt that ties into real interest that we have at Tuskegee. And one of the ways, one of the ways the partnership initially developed is our primary contact at Tuskegee is a graduate of Vanderbilt. So this is similar to what we see between Tulane and Xavier. And Xavier is that when you have faculty at these MSIs that have earned uh, their education, their doctorate from your university, I think that's a really good place to start as long as they're working in an area that somehow ties into the world area that, you know, your, your NRC belongs to. Uh, and I, of course, it's not the only way to do it, but I think that serves as a really strong base from which to start a relationship and then expand out. Okay, I have a question for the panel. Is what has been the most satisfying um, outcome of your collaborations? This is Amanda from UNM. Can you hear me now? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. I'd like to answer the previous question and I can say something about the other one. Um, no, we are not using NRC funds for student scholarships. That's not allowed and so we're not doing that. Uh, we are, however, working with the foundation at Central New Mexico Community College to identify funding for students. We already have um, a nice pot of money for that, and the college is enthusiastic enough about this that the foundation officers are actually being tasked with developing a more generous account specifically for future study abroad programs for students. Um, and in answer to the other question about what has been the most satisfying uh, I think for us, we have developed a very, very impactful program with another institution in Albuquerque, and we're working at a very high level. We're working with deans and vice presidents, and they have all commented that this is a model relationship, and it's one that's been lacking between the two institutions, and that they've been very heartened to see that these sorts of partnerships can actually be developed between a community college and a four-year university. Well, yeah, I also, I mean, I think that's a fantastic question. I think, you know, we get focused on our projects and we forget about what the impact is and what, what we find most satisfying from my point of view. I mean, both of the things that I outlined, um, there's an energy in the room that comes from people from diverse backgrounds and diverse fields uh, that come together over one issue, which is the focus on language and, and culture. Uh, and it leads into really interesting and unusual and unexpected collaborations that, that sustain them, themselves through the year, whether it's organizing just some kind of networking event or a lecture or a visit by a speaker or what have you, or film showing or, or, or any kind of thing. 
and and it's something that you hadn't planned on and it, it leads you down kind of unexpected paths but but also just seeing at world language day especially the energy of the students and their interaction with the employers and and representatives from all these various fields they are really engaged and they're really curious and they really want to know um, you know, the impact that this will have in their lives down, down the road. And it's really something to see how they, they really get into the moment. Fantastic. I can add, um, I, I can answer your excellent question. There's a great deal that has been um, really rewarding about this um, about this process. I would just note that I think for us, one of the discoveries that has been really rewarding is uh, how much of this work is relevant to heritage speakers. Um, it's not always obvious when you work in less commonly taught languages, where one of the constituencies is, say, doctoral students heading out to the field, that uh, another constituency for those same languages is going to be heritage students. And we've gotten um, really just some beautiful feedback from those students. Um, grateful that the courses are being offered, but you see them taking it up and, and uh, um, using it in, in ways you couldn't um, have imagined. So that, I would say, is, is perhaps one of the things we're most um, uh, pleased by and pleased to have learned from. Thanks. Great. Yeah, and, and so for us, I would say, for us, I would say that the most important outcome has been the impact uh, that we've had in the Macon County community through these professional development workshops and particularly through sharing the, the realization that there are very many shared histories in the U.S. South with Latin American experiences. And so focusing on shared human experiences, essentially. And one of those that, that comes to mind, the workshop that we did on the Cuban literacy campaign was very, very powerful for these educators in Macon County, which has an adult limited literacy rate of 25% of the population is a limited literacy. And so having a workshop on the, the 1961 Cuban literacy campaign where people went out it, you know, into the rural communities and taught other people, other their fellow Cubans to read and write had a very, very powerful impact on these educators and really, I think, made them value the work that they're doing in their communities uh, more, more than they already do. And so um, that's just one example of, of one of the positive impacts that we've seen. And here at FIU working with Northwest Arkansas Community College, um, I would say the greatest, the greatest um, reward of the whole process also began as a challenge. When we were starting to help them put together their study abroad to Haiti, um, there were moments where the faculty would say, oh, don't you just want to lead it for us? Or can't we just use your instructor to teach the courses? And, and how about we just do what we need to do to contract you and you can do it for us? And it came out of really, I think, a source of insecurity about whether or not they were going to be successful, whether they were going to have the student interest. Um, they certainly already had the institutional support. And, you know, we, we worked together. We, we spent a lot of time working hard together. And, and ultimately, um, the confidence of their faculty was built to a degree where they realized they didn't need us anymore to develop this program. We had done the groundwork together, and she had all the skills she needed. She had all the contacts. They had the infrastructure in place and the institutional support, and they could lead this from Northwest Arkansas Community College. And that was a great hurdle that was mental more than anything for, for our contacts there to get over, but they did, and when they did, it was fantastic. Great. And I think we have, we're going to uh, go ahead and end right here. And um, I really appreciate everyone today and spending your time with us. And um, thank you so much to our speakers and for all of you out there who are doing great work with our minority serving institutions. We appreciate everything you do. Thank you and have a wonderful day.